Welcome back. Welcome back to my office. Um, we got a lot of stragglers here today. Yeah, Becca. Can you see Peanut over there? Jordan. And the most important one, the queen of insanity. <laughs> and her lightning. Um, we're gonna uh, we're gonna do a lot of things. I'm gonna try to make this fast. Uh, there's a lot I want to do in this episode, um, and uh, yeah, a lot I got to tell you about. Um, we're gonna do a reading. We're gonna do a couple of readings. Um, we're gonna focus on shade today, um, and uh, we're going to um, look at some of the things that have happened this week. Uh, it's been a big week. So um, let's get started. Uh, in the last video, um, I showed you an image of passing that was passing over a bunch of pictures. Um, one is of the two boys. Again, there's always room for Jordan. One is of the two boys. Um, then there's one of Becca when she was a cheerleader in high school, um, her freshman year. And that's the, um, that's the year that I fell in love with her. So I have that, um, we didn't get together for years after that, but that's when I saw her for the first time. You saw a picture of her on our wedding day, looking out a window. It's one of the most beautiful pictures I've ever seen. There's a picture of me and the boys. Um, they're well, pretty little at the time, but um, we're all crouched down and just, ah, you know, so did that. Behind that were um, some bigger picture frames of a dog. Um, her name was Catherine. She was um, kind of a therapy dog for me. Uh, there was a time in my life where I believed that I wasn't worth loving and I couldn't get her to stop loving me. Um, and that is one of the only reasons that I survived. Um, then we got to see some cool stuff. We got to see a um, skull and crossbones that's made out of really thin steel that was welded together. Um, I got it in duck. We had to see a wood burning of a goat. And you guys, I mean, how many times do I have to talk about goats? Uh, <clears throat> a beware of goats sign. A friend of mine named Tiger Gaming. Um, there was a skull and crossbones picture that was made by my son and some Karloff posters. Um, it's just a very, it's a very cool little corner of my office and we'll see more. Yeah, you just got done watching more. Um, and we'll talk about that next week. Uh, Peanut is driving me crazy. He keeps scratching at the carpet. Um, it's driving me nuts. Okay. Peanut, come on. Um, Peanut, come on. So, uh, Oh my God, I might have to send him out. I might have to exile Peanut from my office. We'll give it a shot. Um, okay, so I wanted to show you something from my office. Uh, this is a big one. Um, these are really cool. And I got them probably 2005. Um, they've been in every office that I've had ever since. Um, you're going to see just how cool they are uh, the moment I pull them up. Um, the uh, Terracotta Warriors have always been a really big influence on me. I'm obsessed with any kind of sculpture. And the Terracotta Warriors are just about cool as it gets for me. These are two of them. I'm going to 
going to set them right here for the duration of the video so that you can look at them. Um, I got them at a uh, just a store, I guess, through yard ornaments. They look concrete, they're not. There's some kind of uh, um, clay, uh, but they're very cool. Um, I have one set up on each of the bookcases on either side of my desks. Um, and they're pretty tall, so they like rise up above everything. Um, bookend it really well. Um, I love them. I hope nothing ever happens to them because I plan on having them in my office for the rest of my life. So I'm going to leave them back there for you guys to look at. Um, and uh, yeah, we're going to get started. Um, I'm going to uh, look for the reading now. And um, then we'll see where else this goes. Hey, um, not gonna give you an introduction. I'm just gonna throw you in. It's called Shade, 2002. This is from the book, Normal Street. He shifted out and Siren set a plate of hamburger helper in front of him. He looked around and he not, did not know where he was. He looked at the chair he sat on, the bed with the sheeps he slept on for a while, and he saw the TV, stereo on the coffee table, all things he recognized. So he assumed he was in his own apartment. He looked up at Simon and knew her from before this, but now she looked different. Time had done something to her. She'd begun to look desperate. The relationship was wearing on her. Let's pause for a moment and break back up to earlier that day. I'll give you a small glimpse into what we were talking about. She came to the house around three in the afternoon after she got out of class. She had two hours before she had to be at work and she spent it here. She had walked in and I was sleeping. She had told me she wanted an out, but I had not moved. So she had climbed in bed with me. Sarah so knew this meant that she was on the wait but I had not moved so she could climb in the bed with me. Siren knew this meant that she was on the couch and she took her shirt off to try to entice us to let us in our bed, but there was no response. She laid on the couch, but she kicked around a lot and finally woke me up at, to hang out with her before she went to work. I had a coffee pot designed to be used as a at a campsite. She made us coffee and I tried to remember what time I had been to sleep. I knew I'd gotten into bed at sunup, but then I also knew that Smiling Jack had been walking around the house for a while. I did not know what time he had finally gone to bed or anything else had gotten up after, but the remote was not where it was supposed to be. It was sitting on the side of the coffee table where Shadow liked to leave it when he was done watching TV on the couch. As I looked around the room, I was beginning to see that I had gotten maybe two hours if I was lucky. She took off her clothing and stood in the middle of the room. This was not allowed because sure she could shift out at any point, but she pointed at the shower. Do you mind if I take a shower? No, go ahead, I said. She was out in the flash and getting dressed. After my poetry class today, a guy followed me out of class and pulled me aside and asked if I wanted to go out for a coffee with him. She came out of the bathroom, wringing her hair and her towel. Was it you? Shadow asked. Not bad, she said with a smile. Are you going? She paused. She looked at us with a shocked look and shook her head. No, why not? She stormed across the room and pointed at me. What are we doing here? She snapped. Where is this relationship going? We are not in a relationship. I told you at least a year ago that I was too fucked up to be in a, any relationship any more complicated than friends. You said you wanted to stick around and here we are. I also said many times, including this one, that you need to get away from me. I am only going to hurt you. One day you'll be ready for a relationship. She was still drying her hair, but now she was thinking her mind was buzzing. One day you're gonna look around and see that when it was all going down, 
when you were in the most need, I was there when no one else was. Then she looked at me and we both knew that was not right. In order for that to happen, she needed to get rid of Becca. She needed to get me all to herself. She needed to be the only one I called on when I was in trouble. And that was just not the case yet. So I'm sitting in front of a plate of hamburger helper. It was the cheeseburger macaroni kind, the good stuff. But the author who's sitting in front of it had never eaten it. He had never eaten anything at all. She scooped with her fork and blew on it. He stared confused. She slid it in her mouth and he watched her chew. This was the first time he had ever seen eating before. He picked up his fork and she did not notice him holding it, but then changing his grip, then holding it differently as he stared at her hands. I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt that she didn't see it. When he scooped up what he could get up on his fork, he held it to his mouth to blow on it. Then he watched her to see if he was doing it right. Then he stabbed himself in the mouth. She barked out a laugh. Did you just stab yourself in the mouth? She said. She laughed and he was gone. When Shadow came out, he was furious and he stared for a moment before she pointed at him. Who was that? Shadow did not answer. He did not know, to be honest. But part of it was that she had laughed at him. Whoever had been, whoever he had been, laughed, whoever he had been, laughed at and now was gone. Who do I have? She asked. It was the question that we all loathed. The one that we had begged her dozens of times never to ask. Shadow, who was that who just left? Well, I have no idea, do I? Here he was, and he was new, I think. But now he's gone, and we're not going to see him for a while. Oh, my God. I'm so sorry, she said. Get him back out here. I want to meet him. I want to apologize. No, I'm not going to just shove him out. He's gone now, and that is where he stays. Eat your meal, then get out, Shadow said. She scraped her food back into her pot and grabbed her stuff. She knew that she could not argue if we asked her to leave. It was law that could never be broken. She grabbed her stuff and stopped at the door. Tell whoever it is that I want to meet them when they're ready and that I will apologize. Tell them that I didn't mean to hurt their feelings. I walked her to the front door of the building in silence, then back up to eat. Shadow ate a confusing meal, not knowing what had happened, but knowing it was new. He stepped back and grabbed the phone. If you want me to call her, I will, was all he said. After a few minutes, he dialed Becca's number and he slipped away. Hello, Becca said, nothing. Shush, is that you, she said. They had a system. Shush was still not speaking. If he needed her, he would call up all hours of the night and say nothing. He was, he was after all, incapable of speaking at all. She would ask this question, and if it was him, he would push a button. She had asked if he wanted her to come, over, to come over. If he pushed one button, it was a no. Then she would just talk. He pushed two buttons, then she got dressed and came without pause. Is that you, Shush? Silence. No? Okay. This is Jesse, though. Kind of. Do you need to talk or you just want to hear me talk? She asked. I could talk. And what would you say? I don't know nothing. Nothing at all. He sighed and his sigh became a sob. I know that this is my house, but I don't know where it is. You're in government housing in an apartment building downtown called South Towers in Springfield, she said. I can't eat. Are you hungry? She asked. I could get you some food. No, shadow ate for me, but I can't eat. I tried to eat some dinner tonight and I stabbed myself in the mouth. I just don't know how to, the, how to work a fork. I never have before. Okay, she said. What else? I don't know what I like. Can you give me an example? I don't know what kind of music I like. I don't know any movies. I don't know if I like sports. I don't know how to read. I don't know how to act around people. I just don't know. He was weeping now, nearing the point of uncontrollable sobs. But you know me, Becca said. Yes, 
I mean, no siren. Yes, she just laughed. She just left. She laughed when I stabbed myself. Okay, Becca took a deep breath. Okay, more about that later. Can I ask you a question that might sound a little rude? Sure. What is your name? Becca asked. Pain. Okay, this is not what any of us could have expected. Maybe a few people have dealt with this disorder can recognize what's happening here, but not unless you have been through extensive therapy and are making great strides. I don't know what is normal. I can't tell you if this is unique to my case or if any others have been through this, but I want you to sit back and now and listen. Try to remember that this disorder affects people in many different ways and that it is as varied as those different people and their circumstances. Can I ask you another question, Payne? Okay, yeah, asked. Yes. How old are you? I'm about 15. I don't know how I know, but that is what Informer is telling me. So I guess that's how I know it, huh? I would say. Like I said, how did you get so old, Payne? I'm not sure. We've been talking in therapy a lot about physical abuse and the pain in my life. And I guess I just ended up here, he said. Is that bad? No. No, I don't think this is bad at all. I think this is a good thing, like I said. Do you want me to come over? I can just sit and listen. People are going to make fun of me, he said. No one is going to make fun of you. If they do, we tell Shadow and watch him make a mess. How about that? She was thinking about Siren now. But Siren would not mess this up again. She was on the mission next time she came over. She handled it all with kid gloves, talking and maneuvering until she could get time alone with him. She would join the party because what happened next was a party. He knew nothing, so he had to experience everything. First thing Becca did after work the next day was bring over a massive stack of CDs. Sunshine was introduced to him, and she brought over bags full of movies. Everything from prettier, pretty and pink to bag of ants she brought. She sat with us and watched some of them. Some of them she just left for us to watch. We had to try every kind of food we could find. Fast food first, then nicer restaurants. When we finally fed Pizza Hut, he cried. He said it tasted like home. He made us hamburger. He made... He was made hamburger helper, cheeseburger macaroni, and he loved it. He had a mind for working puzzles. He had Becca read him the first chapter of the first Harry Potter book. Then when she left, he started decoding the act of reading, taking words that she had read and breaking them apart and putting them back together. He got out a comp book and scribbled notes. He worked on the punctuation and he struggled with the entire act of reading. The first 10 pages took him 20 hours to read. The rest of the book took him six. A few days later, Beck was sitting in the living room and they were listening to Garth Brooks when she asked of him about his name. Payne, she said. I was thinking about your name. Yeah, me too. Do you like it? I earned it, he said. But it kind of bothers me when I hear it. It reminds me of bad things and bad times in my life. Have you thought about changing it? Maybe picking something that you do like? She smiled. Something a little more fitting to how you live now? He nodded. What would you call me? He asked. That is up to you. It's your name. You can choose it. You can name yourself anything, anyone. Or just make up a name for yourself, like I said. You can take your time. I just wanted to talk to you about it because I noticed that every time someone calls you pain, you kind of make a face. What if I wanted to name myself Shade? I think Shade's a very cool name. He laughed. That's kind of funny. It took her a second, but she got it. Why would you pick Shade? Because Shadow is, well, he's just so powerful and he protects me and no one messes with him. And I want to be like that, but softer and more comforting. And that's how we got him. That is how we got the man that would one day take over the day-to-day -day running of everything. He was eventually the husband, 
the father, and he led us in the fight against Char. He's one of the greatest people I know, an inspiration to me every day. He is the model I use to run my family and my life, but more about that later. Okay, before I explain anything of what I just read to you, I wanna read you something that came out in Teardrop Road. Um, it's the first time that we see the altar named Pain. And this will show you a little bit more about what I just read you. And then I'll explain the two that I'm reading. And then maybe I might get into another one, but I'll have to see how I'm feeling on how things are hitting me. Um, this comes from the book Teardrop Road, and um, it's the it's in um, uh, Shattered Mind. Pain. So what do we know? I asked Joe and Siren. We were at a Chinese restaurant. We were full and smoking. Shadow Guardian Shush, I said. Servant Teth and Assassin, Simon added. And that one who came out last night that we couldn't get anything out of, do you remember that? I do, Job said. He seemed angry, like he wanted to hit something or someone. What was it, he said? He said, you all need a lesson. Then he was gone, Simon said. I don't know what that was about. A twitch and a sigh. Did he hurt anyone, Guardian said. Job shook his head. No, no one got hurt. It was just a bit off. Were you scared? Guardian asked. They both shook their head no, but in fact, Siren was scared. She told us, she told me later that it was the look in his eye when he said it, a kind of plotting that made the whole thing ominous. We were at the register a few minutes later when I got an image. It was a hulking creature, enormous in height and growth, draped in chains and standing just out of sight in a shadow that my eyes could not penetrate. He's called pain, I said. Job turned with a toothpick and grinned. What did you say? There's another in there. Not the one from last night, but a different figure altogether. He scares me. His name is pain. I couldn't tell you where I was getting this information. It was impossible by textbook definition of the disorder. There's supposed to be no recollection of what was going on outside of the personality shift. But this was not a typical case. My therapist, Stephen, had told me not to expect normal. He said that in his work, he had given treatment to many people with this disorder, and which each of them, it had been different. I trusted him. So when I got an image like this, I embraced it. What does he do? Simon said. Why was he created? He takes all of our pain. And her mind went back to when I was a teenager with a broken hand, a knuckle out of place, and the doctor warned about pain. This is going to hurt, the doctor said. What are you going to do? My mom asked. I have to press my thumb on a displaced knuckle and push it against the bone. I need to scrape the knuckle back up to the bone, to the notch in the hand where it goes and hold it there. Then I need to put a cast on it. It'll hurt. It'll hurt badly. He wanted to numb it, and he did. Needles and doses. But he looked at me and shook his head. We did all that, but it won't make any difference at all. What I just did won't even take the edge off. Are you ready? He said. And that was all I could remember. Rose told me later I hadn't made a face, nor had I shown a bit of strain. I had taken the, the bone being set with no sign of pain whatsoever. She and the doctor had been shocked. Now I was thinking on that moment and many others where I had been in pain and had not felt it at all. He's immune to pain. He's called pain, I said as we walked to the car. I want to meet him, Siren said. Job mumbled something under his breath and we drove off. I was getting drunk that night. It was a weekly ritual, a thing I did every Tuesday. I would call Siren or Becca and we would get to talking. My alters would tell her stories of the things that had happened to us earlier in my life, things they were thinking of. And Siren and Becca would write down notes and talk to us, asking us questions, delving deeper into the puzzle that was slowly consuming all of our lives. I remember that night we found out that different types of drink affected each of us differently. Shadow was a beer guy. When he drank beer, he got drunk fast. 
He was the first one to get wasted. He would talk for a while while he drank another drink and soon someone else would come out. Guardian was a bourbon man. A few shots of that shit and he was out, gone around the track and beyond. I remember that night Shadow and Guardian had been at odds. Before she had left for the night, Simon was telling them what the other had said and they were each getting madder and madder. Their secrets were being told to their enemy and they were raging. Shadow sat on the edge of the bed, slamming one glass after the next of bourbon. Take your fucking medicine, you bastard. When you're out of it, I'm going to work on your bag. We each had a bag of belongings that were vital to us, items that we cherished above all. Shadow intended to destroy all of Guardian's things. And that night, when the great guard was asleep, he did just that. He had told Siren he was going to do it. She left. She had said nothing. They were all deep into their cups and talking. They called Siren after she had gone home. He's a beast. He needs to be put down. He did things to my knife. He threw it in the toilet. He hates me and I want him punished, Guardian said. He begged her to do something about it. And when he got her to promise she would, he hung up and called Becca. How are you tonight, Becca asked. I'm furious. Shadow is a monster and I want him dealt with. He is your brother, she said. He deserves your respect. He threw my knife in the toilet and pissed on it. He's trying to drive me insane. He works against me at every turn. He needs you. You need him. Try to think when he comes at you. Try to get him to talk to you and you talk to him. You're on the same team. Love one another, Becca said. Some people can't be loved. He did another shot of fighting cock and he growled. One bot, no one in that body cannot be loved. Do you know why? I don't want to talk about Shadow anymore, he stated. Just one more minute. Stay with me. Do you trust me? She asked. The answer was yes. Of course, more than anyone, he trusted her and he let her talk. Shadow kept the child pure. What would he have become if Shadow had not shown up? What would that kid be doing right now if not for him? The child is pure. That's all we need to know. Shadow did that. Try to remember that, she said. Now, how's it going with pain? Have you seen him? Shuddering breath, twisted neck, when the phone was dropped. There was sobbing. And Becca was calling out for me. Soon a fumbling hand gripped the phone and she heard heavy breathing. Hello? She asked. Are you there? Who is this? It's me, the voice said. I'm here. Is this pain? She asked. Yep, he said. She told me later that the word made her pause. It didn't sound like the word of a hardened monster would use. Are you okay? He sobbed. That was not what she expected at all. She sat on the other end of the phone and listened. I'm gonna, I have to, I gotta run away, he said. His voice was strange, husky and a bit off. He had a lisp of sorts, a strange growl to his voice that seemed to be pleading with every word he said. If you have to go, I understand, but pain, before you go, please listen to me, okay? Okay. The word seemed grunted and whined. It was not right. She could tell something was not right at all. This was no monster immune to pain, hulking and massive with destruction on his mind. This was not going as she had expected. If you ever need me, Becca said, Guardian can get a hold of me. He hurts me, the voice said. It was a little voice, a shy, wounded thing. Guardian hurts you? And not on purpose, but he hurts me. He asked me to take her. He hurts so much and he gives it to me. He, the voice cried out in terrible agony. Becca waited until the quiet quieted before she continued. Pain, do you want me to come over? No answer for a long time. And so, no, you can't. Don't hurt me. I'm sorry. I'm not going to hurt you, Pain. I would never hurt you. I love you. I want to be your friend. I'm not what they think, he sobbed. What do they think? They think I'm a monster, but I'm not. He went quiet for a long moment before he sobbed. I'm a, ch I'm a child, too. Pain had been crafted the day our body had withstood enough punishment, it was overwhelming. 
and the child could not take more. It happened when we were about three years old. My mother remembers the day perfectly. I was rocking in my room when I was a boy and I was scared all the time that I would lie in bed and rock myself back and forth to calm down. I was rocking myself and my father had enough. She told me he went into the room and closed the door here. She heard me screaming and him yelling. When he walked out of the room, he was wiping blood from his hands. That was the day pain was created. He saw sucked up every morsel of pain we had experienced that day. Our entire life, we had been sending all of our pain to a child. He was out now, a sobbing wounded thing that had been beaten and abused all his life. The horror of it all was too much to bear. It'd be a long time before he would know any peace, before he was healed. It would be still longer before we forgave ourselves for hurting a child. I'm still waiting for that one. Okay, so um, I read those out of order. Um, you should have gotten pain first. And then you should have gotten shade. Um, did that on purpose. In all of my autobiography, I purposely throw things in that are out of order. Um, and it's to mess with the reader's sense of time. Um, it allows them to have, it allows the reader to have a, um, an experience similar to having DID. Um, when you are, um, when you have the idea, your time shifts a lot. You'll be one place doing one thing. Next time you come back, you're in a completely different area and you have no idea how many days have gone by, minutes, hours, weeks, any of that kind of stuff. So um, I replicate that experience in the book by shifting through the time and all that kind of stuff. Uh, anyway, um, that's what uh, we'll just what, what you just experienced. Um, Shade went on to become um, very capable. Uh, he learned things fast. Um, he was good at everything he tried to do. Um, he taught himself to read. And I remember Siren um, got in the car with him, taught him how to back out of the parking space, back, back in, back out and turn. And he got on the road she explained him the rules of the road as he was driving and he was driving in minutes. Um, did it for a while and became the best driver we have. Um, I remember uh, recently, uh, just winter, um, it snowed and we we're turning down this road. The road to get to our house kind of on the edges, it kind of turn so it's kind of a rounded off road and we turned and there was snow started slipping um adam was in charge of the car at the time slides off into a ditch and we're headed for a light pole and no braking is going to save that so adam runs shade shifts out he sees what's happening he sees where we're going he knows exactly what to do to get us out of it completely pulls up us out of the ditch and he sw swings around a little bit and he has us right on the road and he is gone and out comes Adam and Adam's like holy shit um like I can tell you it was insane 
no feat of driving could have saved us from hitting that light pole. And Shade pulled it off. He can do anything. Um, he's kind of like the uh, handyman of the body. Um, any kind of uh, difficult chore that we have before us, he takes care of. He um, became the leader knew all of the other EO states and made sure everybody got time, made sure everybody got what they needed. Um, he was the husband that Becca needed. He was the first father. And he was a father for um, quite a while. Um, and uh, I'm gonna read to you something that is in the book Normal Street, much further down the line than what we have been reading. I'm only gonna read part of the, um, of the chapter to you, um, but this will show you how Shade thinks now. Because he was so small and because he came back so, so much older, um, he thinks in a different way than everybody else and figures out problems that other people don't know are problems. He sees something coming from a long way down. He's smart in a way that we've never seen before in a very um, creative way. Nothing that he ever learned has he ever had to unlearn. He's never made the mistakes that everybody else has made. So he um, he just comes at everything with a, with a fresh viewpoint that you can't you can't get anywhere else. Um, the chapter I'm reading from now is called the Eldest, and it is um, the story of Rafe when he was born. Um, and Shade was his father. Um, everybody else kind of just kind of got out of the way and let Shade be the father. Um, so we've had the birth. Um, it's a very difficult birth. There's a lot I want you to hear about, but that's way later. We've had the birth and we have um, just gotten home. And Becca's mother, who's called Hymnal in here, and her father, who's called Vigil, have both come to the house, see the baby, and live with us for a while and take care of stuff. Uh, and this is, um, this is, this is that. Days, and Hymnal and Vigil are at our house. They're staying for a while, and they have Shadow in his living room. That birth was insane. Shadow said, Becca is a badass. Watch your mouth. The baby is right there, Hymnal snapped. That's bullshit, Shadow said. Shade tried to push him away, but he was, he was not having it. I'm not going to watch my tongue around my kids. You're going to cuss around that boy, Vigil said. Yeah, probably every day knowing me. Don't you think that unhealthy? Not at all, Shadow said. Shade stepped forward. I have a plan. Well, let's hear it, Hymnal said. This ought to be good. Tell me why you get the cuss in front of my grandson. Well, I am an adult. Setting a poor example, Hymnal said. False, Shade said. He will have to learn some behavioral is appropriate at some age and not at another. We will use my cussing to tell him that adults get to do things and say things that children do not. When he gets older, I will use use it to teach him that in some cases, some behavior is appropriate, and in some cases, it is not. What? Hemel said. He will learn that it's fine to cuss around his friends, but not his teachers. That is an authority figure, and they deserve respect. He will learn that when he is in his room with a group of guys, I don't give a shit how he talks, but when in mixed company, they demand respectful language. That will carry into everything else. Hemel crossed her arms. Vigil leaned forward. How do you mean? He asked. 
Well, if you learn that he can talk a certain way around certain people, but not all people, then we can apply that to how he acts when and where. When he is in church, he will learn that it is not appropriate to be loud, but in the front yard it is. He will learn that there are times when fighting is appropriate, but not all times. Fighting is not appropriate at all, ever, Hymnal said, but you said it low enough that Jake could ignore it. As I curse in my son's life, I will teach him that his behavior needs to change to fit the circumstance. That there are codes of conduct for certain situations. But the most important thing I will teach him is that his father is not a hypocrite. That he's always cussed and he always will. It's part of his background. It's part of who his father is. And he will not apologize to it, about it for anyone. Vigil leaned back and stared at me for a few seconds. He turned to him and shouted, leaning forward. How about you? He said, pointing a finger at them. What kind of grandparents are you going to be to my son? What can I expect from you? In 2007, we moved to Milwaukee. We lived in a duplex downstairs from our landlord and lady, and they became essential pieces in our family. Mentor and Marigold were with us all the time. They taught us so much, and Mentor is a true father to me. He remains an integral part of my life, and I have no idea what I would do without him. One day, when Rafe was about one, he was playing with his toys, crawling around the car in his hand, driving it across Morgan, our dog's big belly. Rafe, come see daddy, I said. Nothing. Rafe, come see daddy. Come on, Rafe. Come see daddy. Get over here, buddy. Come see daddy. Becca held out her hand. What do you want? She asked. I wanted to come and get a hug. He's playing, leave him alone, let him play. If you have a good reason, then yeah, but if you just want a hug, let him be. This is important. He needs to come when I call him. Rafe, come see daddy. Rafe, come on, buddy. Rafe turned around and looked at me. Come see daddy. Shade held his hands out and Rafe crawled over. When he got to Shade, he got a big hug. Then Shade told him to go play. Becca scoffed, but said nothing. It was two years later when the ball rolled out into the street between the two cars. Rafe went running after it. Marigold, Mentor, and Becca all gasped. The car was not far from the ball and the driver did not see that ball. They for sure did not see the toddler running out to get that ball. Rafe was about to get hit by a car and no one was close enough to stop him. No, 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 Rafe, don't, erupted from every mouth. Becca's face was drawn in lines of horror. Rafe, come see daddy. Shade said. He said it calmly. He said it firmly. Mid-run, Rafe stopped. He turned on the dime and he ran into Shade. Everyone burst into tears. Shade had arrived as a father. From that moment on, Becca trusted his instincts. We had a boy. That boy had a father. He had a few of them. Okay, so I think that's the readings that I want to give you about tonight's um, topic of shame. Um, I could go into more. Uh, when I had the final confrontation with my mean abuser, um, Shade got us all there and he worked the whole thing out like a general working on a battle. Um, who got to say what, who got to do what, who got to accuse what and make whatever threats and everything so that everybody got peace um, from talking and from that conversation with our abuser. Um, Shade vanished, uh, they all did. Um, there was one point in our life where the kids were not getting along with the alters. It was confusing for them, it was upsetting for them to have so many different people inside of their father, so many different fathers to deal with, so many different personalities. So at one point, the child had come of age that he decided he would take over as the father. Um, he was Becca's only husband and the rest went off into the darkness for a long time. Um, that situation lasted from 2014 until 2019, I think, five years. 2011. 2011 until 2019. 
So for eight years, um, the child or what he became to be called Adam was the only altar that ever came around when anybody else was moving. Um, when the rest of the house was quiet, sometimes other people would come out. But for the most part, it was just, just Adam. Um, at a certain point, uh, we had a conversation, me and Rafe had a conversation um, that brought the rest of the altars back out. Um, but that's for another, another kind, another time. Um, just know that uh, Shade was the leader for a long time. Um, and he did things like that. Things you could never have expected or thought to do. And he, with the cussing thing, he saw things differently than anybody else because he had a fresh mind. He saw how one thing that could be a problem could be used as a positive. Um, she is to this day, the most capable of all of us. Um, he could do anything he wanted. Um, anything he sets his mind to is he's capable of. Uh, So um, he's absolutely vital, extremely humble. Um, he doesn't ask for anything. And uh, yeah, we'd be lost without him. So that's where I'm going to leave it with Shay. Um, and then I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a break and then I'm going to um talk about about the bramble situation and i'm gonna tell you what happened today because i'm actually filming this on thursday and this thursday was a pretty big day so i'm gonna talk about that and then we're gonna get out of here um but uh anyway um give me a break uh let me um, get myself together and then I'll be back and we can talk about some pretty exciting stuff. Okay, so this last weekend was Father's Day. Um, a couple a couple episodes back, I told you that I was putting together a GoFundMe and it was, uh, we reached our goal in one week. Um, I needed that money so that I could have my first Father's Day, or what I was calling my first Father's Day. I've had lots of amazing Father's Days with my kids. Um, Red is 14 right now, so uh, yeah, I've had 14 amazing Father's Days, but never with my own father. Um, so I put together a GoFundMe so that I could drive up to Wisconsin from Missouri, drive up to, to Wisconsin and um, sit at his grave and have, and try to find him. I just wanted to find him, had some kind of conversation with him. So we got in the car. Oh, so anyway, so it was funded. So I, Went and I bought him a Father's Day gift. Um, I bought him a buck 110, which in my opinion is the greatest pocket knife you can get. I got him a buck 110 and I buried it um, in front of his grave. And I did it in such a way where when I was done, the ground looked completely undisturbed. Um, Becca went back to look and she could not find where I had buried it. I cut the ground like sod and 
made a three sided rectangle and then pulled the whole thing up. Um, it worked like a charm. It was, it was perfect. It was beautiful. And I gave him his father's day present. I brought a beer. Yes, I know we like beer. And drank Miller. So I brought a Miller High Life. I don't know if that was the kind of Miller that he liked, but I gave him a Miller and then I drank one. I pulled out a cigar and I smoked a cigar. And I talked to him and I said a lot of things that um, I needed to say. Things about my mother and what she became after they broke up and how he wouldn't recognize her now. Um, well, there was a lot of stuff that I said. I'm not going to go over all of it with you. I don't think you would want to invade my privacy that much. Um, but I, I spent about half an hour there. Becca sat close. I just, I needed that support. She sat close and she heard everything. And um, I said, as much as I felt like I needed to, we took some pictures. I'm going to show those pictures now. Um, here's some of the sunset. Here's one of the dogs cuddling in the back. Here's a picture of me uh, driving. Um, here's a here's a picture of me at the gravesite. Um, and I'm uh, blurring the faces. I mean the names on the site, on the stones so that you never can find them. Um, but here, here's a picture of me, it's nice, nice tune. Now, when we got back in the car, um, we had, uh, we had Pandora up and I had it on a station a certain station that was like for like 2000s bands and um these songs started coming up and when you listened to the lyrics of the songs they applied to me and they applied to my relationship with a man who would be my father and the lyrics of the song came and gave me advice. <laughs> At first, I thought it was just me, but Rafe caught on to it, and then Tobin caught on to it, and Becca caught on to it. It was just, it was very obvious that he was speaking to me in the only way that it could. Um, here are some pictures uh, that were taken of. Um, some of the songs that were being played by the radio. Um, when you look at those songs, and they just kept coming. I was like, if I had heard one song, it reminded me of me, reminded him of, uh, reminded me of him. That'd be one thing, but it was like, it, was, it, it kept happening over and over and over again for hours. This was happening. Am I? Becca, um, Becca. Yeah. I, I, for hours this happened. Yeah, it was amazing. And it, like every, it was like the soundtrack, like everything was just fit exactly right. And we were having conversations and the lyrics would come in in the middle of our conversations, right? And they were just, it was very obvious to me that he was speaking to me through Pandora. Um, so 
So anyway, um, I got home and of course I was kind of messed up for a couple of days trying to get my bearings. And then um, I guess it was yesterday. Yesterday was the day I was awake. So Becca slept in and then when she got up, we went to the kitchen and I just started talking. And I started talking about the autobiographies. I started talking about Teardrop Road. Um, Teardrop had already been uh, edited. We already paid for Sarah Torn, who is one of the big editors, best you can get. Um, we'd already paid for Sarah Torn to um, edit the book. We'd already run through it. I'd read through it at least five times, um, finding little things and cleaning them up. And we realized that we had the book prepared and ready to go. And we had even taken some pictures for a, um, for a, uh, for a cover. And it took us about 20 minutes to decide that the time had come and it was time to send the first volume of the autobiography out. It came out today. Um, June 24th, Thursday, June 24th, came out today. Um, we made a really amazing cover for it. And I'm gonna show that cover to you now. Um, you can see some pretty awesome stuff going, is going on here. Um, the book is called Teardrop Road, as you know. And Teardrop Road is an actual place. And it has this bridge on it. And Teardrop Road is featured in the book. So, yeah. Um, anyway, it just it just all fit. Becca spent hours um, formatting it and getting it ready to go, and today it came out. Um, some pretty amazing things happened when it came out. Uh, one was Sarah Torn wrote a, um, a blog for her blog uh, website that basically explained what it was like for her to um, work on the project, what she thought of it, how it hit her, um, and how important she thought it was. Uh, so Sarah Torn talked about that. And as soon as that happened, another guy from another blog popped up and he was like, this is amazing. And he writes for a blog and his um, focus, he started a series for that blog about um, neurodivergence. neurodivergence, which is like um, any writer that writes fantasy that has some kind of um, different way of a different kind of brain. Um, if you're dyslexic, if you have any kind of mental disorder, um, anything that happens with you that's different from um, the way an, an, uh, a, an, a, a typical brain would work, 
things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a typical, typical brain would work. Um, he wants to talk about it. He wants you to write something about it. He wants to hear what you have to say. Um, how your, how, and when you feature a blog on his, on his site, you will, are supposed to be talking about how your brain works differently from other people's. Why it made you want to write and what it's like trying to write for people who have typical brain function. Um, so he wants me to write something for his blog, which of course I'm going to do. Um, and uh, he's going to, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty positive that he's going to read the book. Um, which I'm really excited about. I've had one therapist read it. Um, and they were pretty amazed. Uh, there are some, of course, I'm going to link it. Um, you can get to it uh, through the Goodreads link and the Amazon link below. Um, but uh, there's some reviews. I'm hoping to get some more. I had a lot of beta readers for this book, so I'm hoping to get some more reviews. Um, I'm sure some more will pour in as things continue. Um, and uh, yeah, you guys know a lot about this book now. Um, well, about Normal Street, the second volume. Um, if you've been following this channel, Teardrop is out. So I would, I would ask you if you find any of this interesting, that um, you go look for it. Um, and if you do, and you have any questions, leave them in the comments of any of these videos. If you have any questions, um, email them to me. Have any thoughts, anything you want to say? I want to hear from you. Um, if you're dealing with this problem, if you're dealing with this disorder, and you need anywhere to talk to, um, reach out. OK. I think that's everything I wanted to say today. Uh, I think that's the episode. So um, I'm going to take off, uh, do all the things. And um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to go now. I'm going to celebrate the release of my book. The most stressful release I've ever had. I'm going to celebrate that now. Um, I think there's going to be screwdrivers involved. Um, I'll let you try to guess whether that means actually that I'm going to be fixing or crafting anything or drinking, um, like, um, orange juice. I'll let you guys decide. You decide if what kind of screwdriver I'm going to be using tonight. I've already figured it out. Um, and, um, we went to Sam's today, and I got this. I got a case of Twix. So that might factor in. Um, I got some tequila, but I don't have any lemon. So anyway, um, I'm just going to I'm gonna do this. My wife's going to do that. What she is doing is she is taking... Um, the ebook of uh, Teardrop Road, and she's turning it into a paperback um, that will be available hopefully very soon. Um, there's rumor that Amazon is now even allowing hardback versions of books to be made, and we're going to look into that so that we can get some hardbacks maybe. Um, they'll of course be pricier, but maybe we can get some hardbacks of Teardrop Road. 
Um, and uh, yeah, anyway, goodbye. I'll see you next week. Do all the things. Thanks for coming. And um, enjoy my baseline on the way out.